Welcome everybody to another amazing episode of Wellness Warriors. As always, I've got an amazing guest with us today. I'm really excited to find out her story. So Siobhan Sarna uh, had a lifetime of struggling with health issues and she made it her mission to demystify her own health struggles and to share that information with others who are struggling. And so her personal mantra is SOS, save ourselves. And that's what she's done to help thousands of people. She's the author of Healing SIBO. She's a TV host. So she's the creator of SIBO SOS. Uh, she's had many um, summits and documentaries. Um, I'm really impressed with the Chronic Condition Research, which is a nonprofit to further research underfunded medical conditions. So thank you so much for doing that. And thanks for taking the time to be with me, Siobhan. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, your good works. We need to get the word out there and help everybody to be well. And um, what, a, what a beautiful platform you have. So thank you. Well, thank you. So tell me your pain to passion story, right? That's where it starts, our personal journey and why you do what you do today. Well, basically, um, when I was little, about five years old, I went to India with my parents and uh, because they were importers and I'm half Indian from India and half Irish and Welsh. And basically I got food poisoning. Then I came home. I was a fancy little New York City girl and we went on a field trip and we milked cows in upstate New York and I drank some of the milk right out of the bucket and I got really sick. And uh, fast forward a couple of years, I'm probably seven years old. And I remember my father saying to my mom, like, should I go to the bathroom every day? Because his Ayurvedic background of just being Indian from India, um, you know, they're more in tune with that kind of body function and flow. And mom was very busy raising two other girls. And, um, you know, I appeared to be perfectly healthy. So she wasn't micromanaging my bathroom habits at the moment. <laughs> I, um, and she was like horrified. And then I was horrified at seven because she asked me about if I was going all the time. And I was like, first time I ever felt any shame around any body function. Not that she shamed me. I was just like attuned to like, why would you be asking me that? It was a very strange moment. Anyway, um, I was having problems. I was constipated as a little girl. And then I um, was never really regular like my friends were. And I always had a little, what we call lovingly the Buddha belly and due respect to Buddha, of course. And bottom line was I, I, I kind of struggled with baseline health, although I was very healthy in other ways. I was then exposed to mold for 20 years. I got Lyme at camp. Uh, my summer camp, I got EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, and there were just a variety of uh, contributing factors to my gut dysbiosis, my gut disharmony. And um, the exposure in the moldy building was accumulation of 20 years of exposure. And I didn't realize it. I didn't, I kind of poo-pooed um, Lyme for sure. And then also mold exposure because I really couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't leave my job. Uh, there was nothing that was gonna change. And so I just was in a kind of a state of denial about it. But I also wasn't feeling well, like legitimately I was going to work, being on TV and having to go home and lie down until, you know, for maybe another extra, eight hours above and beyond one's usual nighttime rest that you hope you're getting. And I was very swollen and I was very bloated and I knew something wasn't right. And my psoriasis was flaring and it just wasn't, things weren't going well. And, and how old were you? How old were you around that time? Oh, this is like five years ago. <clears throat> oh, okay. So we're going from five years old to five years ago. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's been a long time. You know, it was okay before then, but then I think my bucket just got full. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort. And I really wasn't um, flourishing and I wasn't as vital. And you can write that off to getting older, but this was something different. So anyway, I, um, I finally went to a gastroenterologist because I was bloated and I was irregular. And I uh, went to a doctor, we lovingly call him Dr. Run Three Miles in my book, Healing SIBO, because he told me that I should really run three miles. And he gave me an antidepressant and said, you have IBS, here's he had an ancient Xerox copy of the low FODMAP 
guide. I won't even call it a diet. It was just like a list of okay foods in quotes. And um, I was very discouraged. I was kind of insulted because he didn't explain to me that, you know, serotonin and um, neurotransmitters in your gut could be impacted maybe from an antidepressant, maybe. It was all very just like not communicated well. And so I turned to Dr. Google. I finally, through a variety of conversations with girlfriends, um, found out about a SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth breath test, not breast test, breath right. test. <laughs> right. In this market of our conversation, I feel it's appropriate to just really pronunciate yeah. that. <laughs> and, and then um, I also found by speaking to another girlfriend, a gastroenterologist who I lovingly call the digestive detective. And he spent two hours with me at my first appointment, which he definitely obviously didn't need to do, but he was really intrigued by my symptoms, by what I had gone to. He was frustrated with the other doctor and he wanted to see the results of this SIBO breath test that I had done. And I was very shy about reaching out to the other doctor and basically firing them, um, saying, could you please transfer the test results to this new doctor, which is weird because I was just, I'm not really a shy person. Something about it just made me uncomfortable. And, um, you know, when I finally did call it the assistant insistence of this new doctor, I spoke with a nurse and she was like, no problem. I mean, it happens every day, but I, you know, they don't care. So this was not a big deal. Anyway, my new doctor looked at the test results. Now keep in mind, it's 18 months now since I had that breath test. And he looked at it and he's like, Siobhan, this test is positive. And what had happened was at the lab at the University of South Florida, which I didn't even know what I was doing when I was getting the breath test. The person who read the test had written the word positive, crossed it out and hand wrote the word negative. So this whole time I'm thinking I have a negative SIBO breath test, if I even really knew what SIBO was. And he looked at it, he's like, this is positive. We're doing another test, come on now. So we did another test, it was positive. And then I was very relieved, right? It's a very strange feeling to be relieved to get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people who have chronic conditions can relate to that because it's a step. It's like, okay, at least I now have a name for it. At least I now know um, that there's hopefully something we can do about it or not. And it is a box check so you can do the next thing. So that's basically what happened. And I made a vow to myself in the universe that if I figured it out, I would share it with the rest of the world, which is exactly what I've done over the past five years. In those summits you were talking about in the book, Healing SIBO, in the Digestion SOS, Rescue and Relief for IBS, SIBO, and Leaky Gut, in the SIBO Recovery Roadmap course. I mean, I have been on fire, so to speak, with this passion to educate other people. And a lot of it is because no one's talking about their bowel patterns to their people usually. I sat with a nail tech um, for two years, every two weeks, Lisa, and we would talk about everything. We never talked about gut health. And it was preoccupying my brain so much. Turns out she had major gut health problems. And two years in, I, I spent more time with her than I do with my girlfriends, my family, practically. <laughs> we finally started talking about it. And I thought, this was a waste. We could have been on an adventure together, helping each other with exchanging research this whole time. I get it. It's not a comfortable topic. Yes, obviously. But like, we're all grown ups. Let's, let's get on with it already. And one of the things that was really important was that I felt intuitively that there were people with answers. I felt like, ah, oh, there's just this veil between the answer and the situation I'm going through. I was not of the mindset of like, no one can help me. There is no answer. This is, you know, tragic and um, impossible. I did feel like there were people that had to have figured this out by now. And indeed there were, I just didn't know them. And they weren't, you know, commonly found on the web and all that. And so what did happen is I met Dr. Allison Seebecker. Um, I stalked her site. She was a legitimate SIBO expert. I got, finally, she opened up her um, appointments after being on a, a, a research sabbatical. And um, I booked a multiple appointments with her and I loved summits at the time. I just started watching summits 
And I said to her, I was going to do a summit and would she be my first speaker? And I was a little nervous. And she said, well, not only will I be a speaker, I'll introduce you to all my fellow SIBO specialists and um, help you. And that was the first SIBO SOS summit back in 2017. Wow. Pretty fascinating. So great yeah. to hear. So the big question is, what yes. exactly is SIBO? And I'm, I'm curious exactly. about the breath test also. I'd like to hear more about that and how that works. Sure. SIBO is a small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And it is the number one underlying cause of IBS. And it is caused by food poisoning most predominantly. Um, there are other underlying causes. SIBO is caused by something else and causes its own symptoms such as bloating, diarrhea, constipation, alternating diarrhea and constipation, uh, rosacea, restless leg syndrome, strange B12 uh, levels, uh, strange iron uh, levels, low ferritin, um, a variety of things. And it can also be caused by scleroderma, uh, endometriosis, adhesions from surgery, which are the internal collagen scar tissue after you've had surgery to, after a cesarean or whatever holds you back together. It's great. However, it can pull tissue from the small intestine and other parts of the intestines out of place, which can then impact the, and I'll explain how food poisoning works too, migrating motor complex. And the migrating motor complex is the sweeping motion of the small intestine, sweeping out extra bacteria and food particles that when they're not swept out, overgrow and become small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Mm -hmm. And that's what those bacteria or archaea, which is one of the newer, um, and it switches back and forth between these two groups of the bacteria and the archaea, which are very similar back to bacteria. So I don't want to get too technical, but um, what it, it does, it leads to those symptoms I just described. And if that sweeping motion is not working, you'll have the overgrowth. Now, one of the ways that the sweeping motion migrating motor complex doesn't work is if you have adhesions because it's pulled the tissue out of whack. And so even if your migrating motor complex is working, it literally can't sweep because there's like a speed bump in the way. But also when you have food poisoning, there's something due to molecular mimicry that will inhibit the migrating motor complex from happening. And there's a test called the IBS SMART test that Dr. Mark Pimentel of Cedar sinai and MAST program there has developed through Gemelli Labs that can tell you whether or not the antibody that you've gotten from food poisoning is impacting your migrating motor complex. And they call that post-infectious IBS, which ultimately, and for ease of understanding, is SIBO. Not everyone who has IBS has SIBO, but the primary source of this condition is food poisoning. Then the other things that I talked about also can impact your migrating motor complex. The other thing is meal spacing, which is spreading out your caloric consumption throughout the day. So you have uh, four to five hours between each meal because the migrating motor complex will not sweep when you have had a caloric consumption, when, you, when the body feels like it's just eaten. So that intermittent fasting, but we call it meal spacing, um, is also super helpful to sweep your food, your debris out. Interesting. So even if you've had food poisoning as a child, yeah, that's still the bacteria have never been cleared out properly and it's, they continue to overgrow. It can, yes, it can be that most importantly, that molecular mimicry that I was talking about, your migrating motor complex isn't sweeping out. Exactly. So, you know, you can have periods of where you get better and then you eat some high FODMAP garlic or something or an apple, you know, these foods that are beautiful foods um, and it can cause extra bloating and um, diet doesn't actually cure SIBO it manages the symptoms. So you can absolutely feel better very quickly um, from eating a low fermentation diet. However, it shouldn't be done long-term because it does impact the microbiome. All right, so let's swing back to the breath test. What does yeah. the breath okay. test do? 
So the breath test is when you consume a, um, a substrate of a sugar, maybe it's glucose, maybe it is lactulose. And right now lactulose is the most preferred. And you drink, so you do a, a 12 hour special diet, um, which is quite restrictive, but you'll be fine for 12 hours doing it. Then you fast for 12 hours and most people like to sleep during that time. And then they wake up and you know do the test shortly after they wake up. Um, and you drink this solution, blow into a test tube every 20 minutes for typically three hours. And as a result, you then get a test result read properly. Um, you can mail it back to the lab. The test tubes, when they're done properly, are, you know, main, maintain that breath in there. And they will test it to see how much hydrogen, perhaps, or methane you have that is coming out through your breath that is the result of your overgrowth of the bacteria um, feeding off of that sugar that you drank. And when you get a breath test result that is positive, then you actually know what kinds of organisms are overgrown and that can dictate the treatment. Okay, so what is the treatment? Well, there are three major treatments and one is antibiotics. The other one is antimicrobials slash herbals. And the other one is called the elemental diet. And I'm gonna just quickly describe all three. The elemental diet is the most effective. It's also quite intense and it is a liquid diet made up of amino acids that used to be um, for feeding tubes, but now they've actually made better tasting formulations to help you to, you know, Get them down because some amino acids can taste like vomit and the original formulation did it was disgusting and so it's bad because you're just doing this liquid diet for 14 to 17 days then you want to retest wow. and the way that, that works is that it starves the bacteria overgrowth uh, versus actively killing that bacteria so you're they are dying but it's you're starving it so it's a little bit different but you're fed because the elements of food of these amino acids are getting directly into your bloodstream wow and examples of antimicrobials would be would be um oil of oregano formulations like candy backed in ar and br Allicin, as in the garlic extract. Garlic's not great in its whole form, but in the extract, it's very effective in combination with other things to help reduce the bacterial overload. So there's a variety of actually studied formulations and combinations that work really well. Now that will take you probably a month to have the same efficacy as if you did antibiotics that are more traditional, but still highly unusual. And I'll explain what that is. But the other thing is you might have to do multiple rounds of these treatments. And that's really not the way we're used to. We're used to take a pill, do this thing, do these antibiotics or whatever for two weeks and you'll be fine. With this, you're trying to reduce the bacterial load and it does sometimes take multiple rounds. And with the antibiotics, for example, which is rifaximin, and neomycin, if it's the methanogen overgrowth or the um, just rifaximin by itself for hydrogen overgrowth, um, that's two weeks. And then you retest and then you may have to redo it again. Or maybe then you're like, I want to do the elemental diet. Or you've started with herbs. Now you want to do prescriptions. It's nice because you can pick and choose based on your lifestyle, your budget, and what you're up for. And if but if you find something that really works, you may want to repeat that. So would the antibiotics not cause secondary problems with the microbiome? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. So rifaximin is the drug that is given to people for traveler's diarrhea. Okay. And it actually has been found to help the microbiome, believe it or not. And it is, it's a fascinating, fascinating drug. Um, you take it three times a day. There's a, you know, the studies have, you know, specific dosage, but it is, um, when you're doing it just with the hydrogen, it doesn't impact negatively the microbiome. It's when you combine it for the methanogen overgrowth with neomycin, typically. Neomycin is a more systemic antibiotic. So that is tough. It's tough. However, um, you know, you, you can get some other probiotics and the like 
you know, to help reorganize your microbiome afterwards. I'm not a doctor. This is, you know, everything I've learned from speaking to all these experts. So check with your medical professional, of course, and um, do what's right for you. But they do suggest that you stay away from fermented foods until your microbiome is back on track. And certainly during the treatment or the killing phases to not do um, the at least uh, fermented foods. Interesting. It is. Wow. All right. So we know SIBO affects our digestion, mm -hmm. but then how does it impact our, let's start with hormones. How does it impact our hormones? Well, like a which came first scenario, um, they do feel that hormonal imbalance, uh, especially of the thyroid, uh, can be a contributing factor to SIBO. Uh, so I think what I think the consensus is that if you have a slow thyroid, it can contribute to SIBO and being a cofactor, if not the underlying cause. That's not the most famous underlying cause, but a lot of people who have thyroid imbalances do have SIBO. Interesting. And how about our brain health? Oh um, my gosh. Right. So there's this thing called LPS, lipopolysaccharides, that are a, um, again, simplifying it, the, I call it a brain toxin, uh, again, oversimplification, but uh, fo brain fog, uh, things that um, can re really make you feel sluggish are um, associated with the overgrowth of this bacteria, with these organisms. And at some point I had such bad brain fog that I one day could not speak. I had the thought, I was trying to say it out loud and it literally wasn't coming out. And my husband oh. like got pale. I was pale. And I, I, I went and I went and took a nap and drank some water and like prayed. Basically. <laughs> I was like not doing well that day. And I, um, I really experienced it very profoundly. I was stuttering a little bit as well during those couple of days. It was really, really horrifying. And I also attribute that to the mold exposure, but it was a bad combination. Okay. Now, let me ask you, um, how does, how do sugar alcohols affect SIBO? That's a really great question. Um, there, they do tend to lead to bloating. It mm -hmm. really just, um, I, I know that, um, some people feel like certain ones are okay. I have never had luck with them. Um, so I stay away from them. I'd rather have cane sugar a little bit than something that um, is- Manufactured, not, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'd rather have a little bit of cane sugar, a little bit of maple syrup or a little bit of honey. Right, right, right. Okay, I was just curious because- Yeah, it's a good question. I've had, you know, I've had some questions about that. So where does a person start to heal? So they, let's say they go through the, you know, the killing phase, then, then what happens after that? What kind of foods can they eat, not eat? Yeah, well, after that, it's nice to stay on a SIBO specific food guide um, list of foods. This is the, the work of Dr. Allison Seebecker again, who she went through the low FODMAP, the SCD specific carbohydrate diet, the GAPS diet, all these special diets. And she developed something called the SIBO specific food guide. And that's where it's in my book. It's on her site, SIBOinfo.com. And they're low fermentable foods and very specific uh, sort of red light, green light, yellow light um, columns. And it's very specific for the amount of food portions really count here because you might be able to eat, let's say a couple of almonds, but you can't eat 15. I'm just giving you an example here. I had someone say, you know, oh, I don't like the diet in this book. I can only have two Brussels sprouts. Well, Brussels sprouts are highly fermentable. So in the beginning, you should probably only have a couple and, you know, you could eventually build up, of course, uh, once you're feeling stronger and you've cleared some of the bacterial overgrowth. So you do need to pay attention to portions very much, no matter what stage you're in. And then once you, you know, once you're done with the killing stage and you have started to heal your gut lining because SIBO does also call, cause leaky gut, um, you know, have at it. The more diverse your diet, the better. But I remember um, 
having some carrots and being like, oh, carrots are on the list. I am not allowed to eat these carrots. That's so great. And like, I had, you know, three cups of carrots because I was so hungry and looking for something that I could eat. Um, and that was like not a good move. So you have to be careful of the amount uh, because you can get so excited, but you can also overdo it. So do you retest the, uh, the breath test? Yes, Dr. C. Becker absolutely recommends retesting. So if you test, you do the treatment, then you test again. And the reason to do that is so you can see how it worked. Your symptoms probably aren't going to change dramatically, but you could be, uh, okay, so your symptoms may not change dramatically, even if you've made a lot of progress in reducing the bacterial load. So that's also a little bit unusual. So, you know, how you start to feel better after you have a cold or a flu and you feel like, oh, these antibiotics are really working. You might not necessarily feel better until you do multiple rounds and really drop it down, or you may be almost dropped down and feel nothing different. So you retest to find out how you did. How did that treatment work for you? How many more rounds do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And typically, how long have you seen in your experience does it take for somebody to heal from SIBO? Well, I think it really depends on how high your bacterial loads were. And then once you have it resolved, okay, what else is going on? Do you have a parasite? Do you have candida? Mm -hmm. um, are, and these symptoms are very similar. They mimic SIBO symptoms. Have you addressed your underlying cause? Is it going to come back simply because you may have dropped the bacterial load, but if you haven't addressed the underlying cause or, and, or you haven't taken a prokinetic, um, which I'll explain, you are setting yourself up for relapse. It's quite famous to relapse with SIBO, but it's also because so many people don't take a prokinetic, which is either natural or prescription, again, um, a way to stimulate the migrating motor complex. So if you have the uh, antibody from, and you've learned that from the trio, no, uh, from this IBS smart test, then you will, if you have those antibodies, you'll want to do a prokinetic for sure after treatment to help stimulate the migrating motor complex. It's not a laxative, it just does that sweeping motion. Interesting. So what's the first thing that a woman should do if she suspects SIBO? Like if she's you know, having diarrhea, constipation, bloating, what's the first thing she, should she do? I think she should get tested so that she can do that SIBO breath test. And there are a variety of uh, tests out now. There is one called Trio Smart from Dr. Pimentel that will also treat for a third gas that I didn't really talk about, which is hydrogen sulfide. Um, there is aerodiagnostic labs in Boston. There is all of this Quintron equipment, which is fantastic. Um, they also have a lab. You can reverse engineer if you're trying to find a doctor who does these tests uh, by calling the labs and seeing if they'll share with you who in the area has the equipment, does the test. Um, and then once you get that test, get your treatment under, get your treatment going, help to manage your symptoms by doing the redu reduced fermentable diet and then retest and then reapproach and meaning that another treatment round perhaps. But the thing is, is that you, if you don't test and you just guess, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm bloated. I have constipation, I have diarrhea, whatever it is. Well, you could be missing parasites you could be missing candida, but it also mimics other things. Mm -hmm. It mimics, not to scare anybody, but ovarian cancer. There's a lot of bloating with that. It can happen. So you don't want to miss that. You want to test so you know. Very good. I always tell our women in our community, always test, don't guess, right? You want to yeah, find right. out what's going on with your body. So, so good. Amazing information. I've always been curious about SIBO, never really dove into it, but what really enlightening, really, really some great information. So you have a free gift for our listeners. I do. I do. It is our cookbook. It's our SIBO friendly cookbook with those SIBO specific food guide foods. And I have it written down here and I'm sure you'll post it. The link it is, um, let me just make sure I, I do it right. I don't want to mess that up. Uh, it is, I think it's SIBOSOS.com slash recipes. Okay. 
Well, we'll yeah, just get with Randy and uh, yeah. we'll make sure we post the right link. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. Yeah, there are a ton of recipes there. Um, in my book, I have uh, 40 recipes plus. They're vegetarian and that's really tricky because vegetable fiber does feed the organisms. And while I'm a vegetarian, obviously not everyone is, but it's harder to be a vegetarian with this condition. So you can slap whatever protein you want on there. Um, but I decided to make the recipes vegetarian so I could approach the most difficult and then you can customize it to your heart's content. Okay, so, so protein is actually not detrimental to the SIBO diet. It, uh, the bacteria love fiber. So vegetable fiber, can be a source of discomfort, which is why you really need to cook your food well. You don't wanna do a lot of raw food in the beginning here. Mm -hmm. And you need to also pick and choose which foods because depending on which food it is, will um, depend on how much fermentation possibility is present. Like That's apples cool. are high, um, mm -hmm. garlic is high, fermentable possibility, onions, except the green parts of, um, leeks and scallions are okay. It's quite specific and intricate, but not impossible. Okay, so taking prebiotics powder may not be a really good idea for somebody yeah. that's evil. It's not really a great <laughs> idea. It really isn't. Oh, that's not, amazing. Not a, yeah, give yourself some, some treatments uh, once you've tested and get yourself sort of lower in the bacterial load and knowing that your migrating motor complex is sweeping, and uh, I know it's kind of counterintuitive, right? But there are gatekeeper probiotics, and that's great um, because they can help get rid of, you know, poor players in the microbiome. But you don't want to really do any prebiotics. Food is prebiotics, right? You mm -hmm. don't want to do any prebiotic supplements. Um, until you reduce the bacterial load based on the conversations I've had with the experts. Just goes to show you, don't guess, always test, right? Because you may think, oh, I need to take these prebiotics with probiotics. And yeah, so such great information, Siobhan. So thank you so much for all that you do. And where can people find your, your information in your book? Uh, you can find it on Amazon and where all books are sold. And it, there's also a beautiful audio book of it that is an award-winning actor, actress who, um, who did the narration. Um, and my website, SIBOSOS.com. So SOS used to mean like, you know, someone come and save me, but it's come through this time to my interpretation to be save ourselves. So you can work with your practitioners. There's a lot you can DIY, but getting that test is super, super important. And you need a guide to help you figure it all out. That's what I'm here for, what Dr. Seebecker's here for, what our courses are for. And um, I wish everybody the very best. Thank you so much for all that you do. All right, so this is Dr. V sending you a big healing heart hug. Till next time, bye for now. <laughs>